Okay, I'm psyched. Um, okay, so you see a title, you see an image of our old building in Rockville at the bottom and our new, our new building in La Jolla. Um, but what I wanted to, what I want to talk to you about is today is really 17 years of work, if not more. And the thing that has driven the exploration of the Venter Institute for the last 17 years since I joined it has been this, this idea of trying to define or to understand this idea of what is life through the lens of genomics. And so more specifically, one of the things that has been at the heart of our efforts over this whole period has been to discover what genes are necessary for life. Or another way of saying this is what are the tasks that a living cell has to perform? And so what I want us to look at here before we really get into the, the, the data is, is this is sort of some of the highlights of the minimal work since 1995. So the Venter Institute in 1995 published the whole, the complete genome sequences, the first two of them for, for cellular organisms of Haemophilus influenza and Mycoplasma genitalia. And then in 1999, thinking about this minimal cell idea, Clyde Hutchison and colleagues did the first global transposon mutagenesis of Mycoplasma genitalium, which is the organism that has the smallest genome we know of in nature that can grow in a um, defined laboratory medium. And he found that 370 out of about 500 genes were, were probably essential and they discussed approaches to build a synthetic cell. Uh, then in 2003, again, thinking about this idea of building a synthetic cell from the bottom up because we didn't have the capacity to work with mycoplasmas. There just weren't the techniques to whittle the genome down. It was the idea, could we really do grand scale genome synthesis? Um, and they made a 5,000 base pair FIAX-174 genome in about two weeks and at the time that was unprecedented. And then there were a series of four papers in science that went from genome transplantation to synthesizing a 500,000 base pair genome to eventually producing this cell we call JCBI SYN 1.0, which was an almost exact copy of the genome of, the, of, of an organism called Mycoplasma mycoides. And we called our synthetic genome um, Mycoplasma mycoides SYN 1.0. Now, since then, in 2016, the JCVI published a paper describing a near minimal cell, JCVI SYN 3.0. Last year, we partnered with Zan Luthi Shilton's University of Illinois team of computational biologists to build a flux balance and kinetic whole cell computational models of this minimal cell. And currently, there are 37 research groups who are also using our organism to try to build a, and to build new organisms and understand the first principles of life. So again, thinking about minimal cells, you know, very much a lot of science in the modern era has been a reductionist view. And so physicists had the hydrogen atom. They were able to use what they learned from the hydrogen atom to understand the basic principles of chemistry and physics and matter. They could do things with the hydrogen atom that we still can't do with more complicated atoms like carbon or uranium, et cetera. Early molecular biologists used phage, Phyx-174, for instance, at 11 genes to try to understand the basic principles of molecular biology and micro microbiologists have frequently used mycoplasmas, I mentioned mycoplasma genitalium, as models for minimal cells, even though they were far from minimal in their, in, in their natural form. So our view 
is that the minimal cell is the hydrogen atom of biology. Feel free, by the way, if you want to ask a question all along. Um, anyway, moving along. So let's define what we, what we think a minimal cell is. And we view it as a cell that contains only the essential genes for independent growth under ideal laboratory conditions, meaning you can't take any gene away without a loss of vi viability more aptly. Uh, in some cases, you can't take a gene away without a significant loss in growth. It has all the machinery for, net for, for cellular life. And ideally, if the function of every gene is known, then it would be possible to understand a com to completely understand what it takes to be alive. Um, and this could lead to elaborate and very, you know, in essence, every atom computational modeling of minimal cell behavior, and then to predict the effects of environmental variations on metabolic pathways, etc. Now we live in the real world. There are organisms that grow very, very slowly. So we define this a little more precisely. An organism, we think of it as a minimal organ cell is an organism that can divide every two hours and no gene can be removed without significantly slowing, slowing the cell growth rate. Here's another example of our view of biology at the JCDI. And I like to think that this is the view of synthetic biologists. So we think of the cell as sort of a two-part system or a computer, if you will. The DNA genome is the piece of software that constitutes the operating system of the cell. And the cytoplasm and all the other parts make up the hardware that runs the cell. And without each part, life is impossible. The target for our minimization work is a mycoplasma again, very small organisms, and I'll define this, called mycoplasma mycoides. And you get an idea of the size of a mycoplasma bacterium relative to E. coli or a T phage. So it's a low GC gram positive. The organisms are actually opportunistic pathogens of goats. Um, it is already a near minimal cell with just a million, about a million base base pairs and a little less than a thousand genes. Like all mycoplasmas started from, have, have evolved from more complicated organisms like Subtilis, Bacillus subtilis or Staph aureus, but they live in such stable environments that they were able to throw away a great deal of their, um, of, of, of the genes they encoded. And so mycoplasmas have minimal metabolic complexity although they're only capable of living in these very, very defined niches. So they're a total heterotroph, they make nothing. No amino acids, no nucleotides, fatty acids. They have no cell wall and they grow in extremely rich laboratory media. Their colonies, as you can see here, here's a cell that expresses uh, beta-galactosidase, make a nice one millimeter egg-shaped, uh, fried egg-shaped colony in about in about two or three days. To build what we called a synthetic bacterial cell, although more precisely when we say that, what we really mean is a cell that has a chemically synthesized genome, we had to develop three significant technologies. And this, these were uh, the first three of the publications in the science paper, the, the three, the, the four science papers I talked about. We had to develop, we had to learn to clone a, an entire genome um, from oligonucleotides or, or to synthesize an entire genome from oligonucleotides. And then we would park that genome in a yeast cell so that we could produce enough genomic DNA to then install it in a different bacterial cell in a process we call genome transplantation which is seminal to a lot of things that we are uh, doing now. And I'll get to that point later. Um, as I said, there were science papers. So in 2010, we published a paper about JCVI SIN 1.0. And I would happily have a tattoo of these micrographs on me, although I probably want actual size. 
And then four years ago, we published about the near minimal cell. And so I'm going to talk to you now about how we design the minimal cell what, or, or a near minimal cell and what we're doing with it. So one of the things we really wanted to understand if we got this minimal set of genes is to figure out what, in order to get life, what cellular software uh, must the genome encode? And so we want to know what's, what the soft, what task these cell, you know, a cell has to perform. And we came up with this list. Now, by, by a task, for instance, all cells need lysine. And so it doesn't matter what genes do it. For instance, lysine, you can have a 20 gene pathway that will synthesize lysine, or you can have one transporter that brings it into the cell from the, ex from, from, from the extracellular medium. And so this has been a lot of what has driven our goals of making this minimal cell. Um, and to do it, we used like, you see so often in synthetic biology and in fact in engineering, this design build test cycle or design build test learn cycle. So for design, um, the champions of this were my two of my scientific heroes, uh, Ham, Ham Smith and Clyde Hutchison. And the basic notion here is we had to figure out what genes were essential in the natural mycoplasma mycoides in the wild type. And so that we could re, so that we could produce a cell producing that expressed only the essential genes. And once we learn the essential genes, then we would take one of these two approaches. Um, so for instance, with coli, uh, groups in Wisconsin and in Japan have done a top down sequential deletions of E. coli to produce a somewhat minimized E. coli genome. Whereas our goal was to figure out what genes were essential and then take a bottom-up approach where we would design and chemically synthesize and then install this genome in a bacteria with, in, in a bacterium. And if we've got the right genome, we would produce a viable bacteria. To figure out essential from, to distinguish essential from non-essential genes, so as I mentioned, in 1999, Clyde Hutchison did the first global transposon bombardment experiments where he used a TN4001 containing, at the time, it was not a tetracycline, it was a, um, it was a gentamicin resistance cassette, but we have a transposon that has the, trans, that has the antibiotic resistance gene in it. And if you drop a transposon into an essential gene and then select for cells that are, uh, if, if you drop it into the genome randomly and, and select for cells that are viable after, uh, based on, uh, on antibiotic resistance, if the transposon goes into an essential gene, you get no cells, no, no, none of those, none of, none of those cells survive. If it goes into a non-essential gene, then you can sequence out from the non-essential gene and, or, or from the transposon and figure out where the location is. And so for instance, in mycoplasma genitalium, we found that of the global metabolism, about 25% of it was non-essential. So this is a genome that was uh, 500,000, 580,000 base pairs, and we were able to knock it down uh, to, in theory, a genome of less than 400,000 base pairs by knocking out 115 out of 485 protein coding genes. Okay, so fast forward, we were unable to trans, to, uh, even though we made a, um, we, we thought, we, we wanted to make a, my, a reduced mycoplasma genitalium, we never did, um, and we'll get to that about genome transplantation. So we were working now with JCDI SYN 1.0, and we were trying to devise our strategy to make a synthetic genome. And Craig Venter comes to us, to, to the team, and he says, um, SGI has some additional um, genome synthesis, gene synthesis capacity, and so do you guys have a model of a 
you know, what genes need to go into this so we can design a genome. And, um, you know, several of us said, sort of. And he said, okay, well, so at the end of the week, let's have your model and we will synthesize this thing because we're going to do what we call the Hail Mary genome. Oops, sorry, wrong, wrong way, wrong way. So Hail Mary pass, it's an American football term. Um, it's a desperate attempt to win the game at the end of the game and you fling caution to the win and it's done in the last seconds of the game and you hope for luck. So the Hail Mary genome, we're gonna fling caution to the wind and we are gonna take this quickly made, hastily designed genome based on incomplete date, transposon data, do it at the beginning of the project and hope for luck. And so we synthesized a minimalized genome in eight overlapping pieces that we then trans, uh, transform into yeast and yeast assembles them. We took, and we took, um, and so if, if you wanted a complete minimized genome, but we have our genome in eight pieces. We took a genome that was one eighth minimized and seven eighths wild type. And so we made eight of these and we tested all of them. And to our great delight, one of them actually, segment two was viable. Uh, but this gave us hope about our approach and we were ready to do a better job designing the genome now. Now in the paper uh, that we wrote, we realized we really can't call it the Hail Mary genome. And Ray Schwong, one of our teammates came up with um, for HMG, which is what we refer to, it was actually now the hypothetical minimal genome. That's my first joke of the talk and we'll keep going from that. But at this point, we knew we needed a better, more, more methodical approach to tra TN5, to transpose on Bob Marmot to define essential genes. So we took this cassette uh, that has a pyromycin resistance gene and then the transposon um, 19 base pair ends and terminator sequences and we mix this with cloned TN5 transposase to make this transpososome complex. We would then uh, put this into a culture of mycoplasma, oops, sorry, in, into a culture of, where's my cursor? I know I have it, of mycoplasma mycoides. We plate this out on, um, on, select, on selected media and we get tetracycline resistant colonies uh, that, I'm sorry, pyromycin resistant colonies. And we would then serially propagate this to select for fast growers. The rationale being that at P0, we will have a mix of quasi essential genes and essential genes. And in fact, we may have even genes that knocked out that, you, that are not even um, non-essential. Uh, at P1, we're selecting for the fast growers. And then at P4, we should have only essential genes. Uh, we then um, take the genomes, this population of genomes, we either, we fragment these and sequence out from the transposon, from the transposon insertion. And we then can, based on mapping the, the sites of the transposon insertion, we identify three classes of genes. And so essential genes have no transposon insertions. Impaired growth genes, what we call quasi-essential genes, have insertions only for the, the P1 library. They don't have, but these green genes, these, uh, these clones grow more slowly so by the fourth passage, these will have been lost from the population. And then truly non-essential genes will have a mix of these red bars, which are library from the uh, passage four, as well as the white bars from passage one. And so we found that about half of the genome was non-essential, um, a quarter was essential, and 25% was quasi-essential. We call those genes I genes. Um, and so using these design rules, we applied this to the eight segments and redesigned our genome 
uh, and this was reduced genome design one to produce these eight segments um, and which was about a 50% reduction. And we cloned the eight segments into genomes that were, that were seven eighths seven eighths non-minimized, i.e. segments from JCBI sin one and one eighth minimized. And so uh, the build strategy for this, Dan Gibson started by making thousand MERS and has an elaborate uh, cloning strategy to produce the genomes that is well described in our paper from 2010 and then this and, and, and in 2016. So both strategies of minimization and just cloning and, and uh, synthesizing the entire genome. But again, we're using this AP strategy that has segments from SYN 1.0 and segments from the reduced genome design. And we use recombination mediated cassette exchange to produce complete genomes in yeast. Um, we, have, we can mix and max these, mix and match these to build intermediate genomes that are partially or, or one eighth minimized or uh, combinatorially put together or, or completely minimized. And so we now have to test these using genome transplantation. Genome transplantation was uh, fundamentally, it is like doing a chemical transformation with E. coli. So we treat the cells with polyethylene glycol and calcium. And then somehow mystically a synthetic genome that we've isolated from yeast that has a tetracycline resistance or, or pyromycin, a resistance marker in it, goes into the genome. And then we select for, um, we will plate this out in, or, or put this in, in normal growth media and the cells will grow and you'll get a cell that is transiently diploid. This will divide and so you get a cell with the native genome from a different bacterial species, Mycoplasma capricolum, or a genome or a cell with a new synthetic genome that has the, tetra, the antibiotic resistance marker. You then treat with tetracycline and only the cells with the tetracycline resistance marker survive, plate these out and you see what you get. And to our great delight, all eight of the genomes that were seven eighths wild type, one eighth minimized grew. This was just fantastic. All grew with doubling times less than two hours. We saw this by electron microscopy. This was just super. This was like one of the greatest things that had ever happened as far as we were concerned at the time. Now, the complete genome, RGD1, was not functional. We were able to get genomes that were combinations. So for instance, RGD that had segments two, four, six, seven, and eight shown here made colonies that were smaller, meaning they were more slow growing than SIN 1.0, but they grew pretty well. Other strains didn't grow quite as well, but we rationalized, we, we, we decided that the problem was synthetic lethals of quasi-essential genes. So for instance, um, by that, I mean, if you have two genes that both encode the same quasi-essential function or in fully essential function, then uh, if you take out one of them, the cell will grow, but if you take out both of them, they won't. Imagine an, air, an airplane, uh, the 737 can fly with only one engine, and it could be the left or it could be the right, uh, but you can't get away without either of them. So for instance, the minimal cell uh, or mycoplasma mycoides has two ribosomal RNA operons. And we knew both of them were pounded by transposons, but we knew for certain that you had to have one of them. So we never considered taking out both of these. So now it's time for a second round of design build test. In this instance, what we've got to do is figure out what the quasi, I mean, the synthetic lethals are. So we have a, a reduced strain that has genomes that has reduced segments, um, sorry, two, six, seven, and eight. 
And we build a genome that has those segments and send, send 1.0 segments, non-reduced, for the other four. We then do transposon bombardment, and we find that 26 genes that were previously non-essential in wild-type mycoplasma mycoides are now is quasi-essential or essential. So we add back those 26 genes and produce uh, to segments to segments one, three, four, and five, and produce our uh, reduced genome design too. And to our great delight, that cell was viable. It grew uh, in about two hours. It was a little slower than wild type, but we thought, you know, now we're cooking. We did one more round of this, and we took uh, so you know, some 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 factoids about JCDI Sin Sin 2.0. Um, we did one more round of this to remove 37 additional yeast genes, and we produced this cell, JCVI SYN 3.0, which had a genome of 531,000 base pairs. And at this point, in, we start thinking about analyzing this puppy because we've been in tool making mode for um, 15 years, 16 years. And now it's time to think about actually figuring out, using this as a platform to understand the first principles of cellular life. Here's an electron, scanning electron micrograph of the minimal cell made by Tom Dernick at UCSD. Uh, but I want you to think of, your, of the cell this way. This is art by Urs Welrus, a Swedish artist. And here's the way I'd like you to view the cell. It's the sum of all of its parts. So what's in the minimal cell? The genes that we kept were mostly involved with the synthesis or processing of macromolecules. We also kept genes involved in cofactor transport, nucleotide and lipid and amino acid salvage and biogenesis. And we kept surprisingly a lot of genes having no biological role assigned. So we kept about, about a third of those genes that were in the organism. We got rid of most of the genes of no, of, you know, that we didn't know the function of, mobile elements, uh, transport of other carbon sources. We were surprised to get rid of genes involved in the cytoskeleton and glycosylases that make rhamnose and attach it to proteins. I have collaborators who think this is the most remarkable thing we've discovered in this whole process. So again, here's what we kept in the cell. About half of the genes are involved in the expression of macromolecules or preservation of genome information. And surprisingly, a lot are involved. We have no idea what they do. So here's an important figure. We took our, our, um, all of the protein, all of the genes, and we blasted them sequentially against a whole series of other organisms. If a gene has a ortholog, a close ortholog, in another one of these organisms that are listed by the different bars or, 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 or lines on this diagram, it gets, a, it gets a colored mark here. If it is missing, you get a white space. And we subdivide the genes that are present in, oops, sorry, into equivalogs, meaning we have a precise idea of what the genes do based on wet science in a mycoplasma or something, or we really know what the gene does. Probables, we've got a pretty good idea. Putatives, not quite so good. And then generics are unknowns. We really, so a generic might mean you know it's a hydrolase or an unknown, you just haven't got a clue. And the genes are largely conserved. And this was with very stringent blast uh, blast requirements. And so what we've been doing, what we've been focusing on since 2016 is to define the functions of the 149 essential genes that we currently don't know what they do. And as of now, we're down to 103. We're working on an update paper where we give a view of what's happened, what we've learned about the genome in the last four years. But one of the things I wasn't expecting when we started this process. Uh, and when I show this slide in Japan, 
uh, no one has, or Europe, no one has a clue what I'm talking about. But again, from Field of Dreams, we built the cell and people started calling me saying that they wanted to collaborate. They wanted to work with us. And so, as I said, we, current, we currently have 38 active collaborations. And here are just a few of them, of some of the things going on. And to close up, I want to offer you three vignettes about things that I think are really interesting and fun. And the last one will be a project that I have with Kate Adamala, Chris Kempis, and Wilhelm Huck, uh, where we are trying to build a synthetic bacterial cell from non-living parts. So first, you know, our vignettes, I want to talk about minimal cell morphology and giant cells. And I'm doing this with James Pelletier and Elizabeth Strychowski, uh, who have been terrific colleagues. And we've been working on this now for seven years. And we're writing a paper up and hopefully we'll get this out soon. But they found from, not from the electron micro micrographs, but from some direct observations of the cells they did in microfluidic devices that, so if you look at this in, uh, electron micrograph of normal synthetic, uh, I mean, I mean uh, the wild type mycoplasma mycoides, um, it has cells that are about 400 nanometers, but the cell that was seven eighths wild type and one eighth one eighth minimized that had segment six minimized, these were the cells it produced. And remember, these images are done at the same size. So some strains, genomically reduced strains, have radically different or radical variations in size and shape compared to wild type mycoplasma mycoides. And James and Elizabeth did this in microfluidic devices that have um, these channels that have little chambers going off to the side. So a large number of these going off to the side with these dimensions. We flow media containing cells down, down these channels and some of the cells, we, we try to get a cell that has one or two, I mean, a flow cell, a, a, a chamber here that has one or two cells in it. And then we can watch those cells propagate by continuing just to flow media down. And here you see a video of what's happening in these cells over time. So if you look at wild type SIN 1.0, over time, when you do a bright field image or an M cherry image, where we have M cherry, the fluorescent uh, M cherry that you can see fluorescence in the cytoplasm, you see this is what the images look like. Or here's a micrograph. M. cherry here at the bottom, uh, direct optics at the top, and this is over about 13 hours. 400 nanometer spheres, this is what we were expecting. Now, this is what SIN 1.0 looks like based on A with host staining or membrane staining. What we expected. Now, this is JCDI SIN 3.0, and our jaws dropped, and we use that term too much, but I just can't believe this. This is a, a video of uh, about 12 hours, and you see M. cherry here, and it makes from one cell, it makes this spaghetti-like string with these vesicles. It's like, what the hell is going on? And we saw that there were these vesicles. It just didn't look normal. This has astonished us. Uh, again, we didn't know what was going on uh, and we're very curious about this. Now, we found that we had made uh, in the process of producing the cell, this cell that we call JCVI SYN3A now. And in segment six, because we know that segment six, the other set, so the, the genes, the loss of genes responsible for the altered growth morphology is in segment six. And we had a mutant in segment six that had 19 extra genes. This is the 19. And we looked at this and we said, ah, aha, it makes perfect sense. The Z ring um, membrane anchor, CEPF and cell division protein FTSZ were missing from this. 
So it makes perfect sense. So if we add these back, you'll get a normal phenotype. And that, you know, it was a brilliant hypothesis, we thought, but it wasn't true. Through elaborate effort, we have now found that it takes seven genes to restore the phenotype from the, the near normal phenotype of, J, of sin, uh, wild type phenotype by adding those genes to JCBI SIN 3.0. Now, this we're going to publish about, and I think it's a really interesting story and gives some insight into how cells manage their metabolism. Another thing we've been doing, as I mentioned, with Zan Luthi Shulton, who leads a team of computational biologists at the University of Illinois. They approached Clyde Hutchison shortly after the paper was published, and they wanted to do computational modeling of the minimal cell. And their, their idea, they had been doing this with coli, but they thought that a minimal cell was an ideal organism to cast a complete computational model of. And so they have made this elaborate flux balance analysis model of JCVI SYN 3, 3A. And we like SYN 3A relative to SYN 3, even though it's a little bit larger, it is much more behaved. It's easier to pipette. It makes normal looking cells. It's much, much easier to work with. And so really that's the only thing we work with these days. Uh, but this model tries to take into account all of the metabolism all of the metabolic reactions we can un we understand in this organism. Uh, and so it's a fairly complete network. We understand how ribosomes go together and they have lots of parts, but we think of those in this model as just a single functioning tool. Um, we can, you know, other models have already dealt with that for E. coli and an E. coli ribosome is fundamentally the same as a minimal cell ribosome. And so if we, in doing this, we found that the model pretty precisely, um, at the way it was made, uh, mimicked what we, what, what we saw the actual cell do. But we found some things that we think were clues into biology. So in order for a cell to grow in two hours, I hear someone may be getting ready to speak to me. Nope. Anyway, um, for a cell to grow in two hours, the model predicts it needs a transaldolase, but we can't find any gene in it that looks like a transaldolase. Similarly, an NADH oxidase, so they're an um, NAD oxidase, the model predicts that with without a, without one, the cell will only divide in 6.6 .6 hours. And the cell originally had one, but we found it non-essential, so we took it out. So something has to be doing this, we argue. Or that pyruvate dehydrogenase sublate, subunit E1, the cell needs this in order to grow at the rate it does. And so we have built those into the model saying that these things have to be there. Now, ideally, we could put a transaldolase, a NADH, an NAD oxidase, or a P PDH subunit one back into the cell and then do transposon bombardment. And what we hope is we will find that a gene that was previously essential now becomes, uh, I'm sorry, previously not, uh, a, a gene that was previously essential or quasi-essential, quasi-essential will now be non-essential and we can identify the, the genes encoding these protein functions. Uh, we also still a better argument for the use of this, this particular organism. So in our cell, we have a really tiny fraction, you know, 90, in their model, there are 91 genes that are non-essential, I'm sorry, that we don't know the function of. Whereas if you look at mycoplasma pneumoniae, a cell with about eight, about 900 genes, or uh, E. coli, which has about 4,000 genes, there are vastly larger fractions of the genome, the gray section here, that are non-essential. And so this is one reason we think modeling makes so much sense. We will soon be publishing a more complete kinetic model of the genome. The last thing I want to talk about, um, and also whole cell computational models, as I say, they, 
They identify limits of our knowledge. They predict complex multi-network phenotypes, suggest future experiments. And then if we can build an active comprehensive model that includes all cell components, does that mean that we're really beginning to, or we really understand the cell that, that you know, uh, mantra from synthetic biology, uh, Richard, Richard Feynman's, and I probably get this wrong, what I, what, I cannot, what, what I cannot create, I cannot understand. So moving on, last, last vignette with Kate, Chris Kempe's computational biologist, and Wilhelm Huck, a, uh, a uh, transcription translation cell-free system uh, researcher at Radboud University in the Netherlands. So again, the idea here, in 2010, we built the synthetic cell genome, a, a synthetic genome, and installed it in the cytoplasm of a living cell. Now at the time, uh, this produces a cell controlled by the synthetic genome. And by standards then, that might have been called a synthetic cell, but certainly not now. So what we're trying to do is to assemble a living cell from non-living components, the ribosomes, the tRNAs, et cetera. And the challenges here are monstrous. Uh, but the rewards for synthetic biology for everybody, we think, could be huge in terms of our capacity to do new things with cells. So again, in 2010, we took a, we transplanted a synthetic genome into a genome, into a cell from another organism to produce a cell that is programmed by the synthetic genome. What we want to do now is take components from an organism that the individual components are non-living and put them back together to make a living cell. So we got, we're, we're closer than you might think. Remember genome transplantation. So we can also treat the recipient cells in a genome transplantation reaction with a chemical called mitomycin C that destroys the resident genome by cross-linking nearby G residues. Then in, under conditions of the transformation, we can taking a cell that is completely non-viable, it has no genome, we can install a new genome and make a cell that from, from non-living parts. Uh, we euphemistically refer these to these as zombie cells and we hope to publish this paper soon, um, really soon. But we know from our transplantation experiments some things that have guided us a little bit in our ambitions to make a cell from non-living parts. So Carol Artigue's team in Bordeaux, now Carol was the original uh, creator of the genome transplantation technique. So we, we have long known that the, we can only do transplantation in a subset of mycoplasmas. And as you see here, so mycoplasma capricolum genomes, so same genome, same species transplant produce, um, so here we can, if you look at, um, transplantations from one species to another. So same species, we produce more transplants, either bacteria to bacteria or yeast genome to bacteria. Um, the more distant you get from the recipient cell, the fewer transplants you get, which suggests to us that relative to creation of cells from non-living parts, we think that the genome and the cytoplasm have to be closely related. And rather than try to make a cell from non-living parts using E. coli, which is what most people do there, this is, for instance, what the Dutch team's trying to make a synthetic cell are using. We thought we would use mycoplasma because we understand uh, how to do transplantation. The lack of cell wall could make it easier the simpler genomes could be easier. And so the proposal that Kate and Chris and, and um, Wilhelm and I came up with, the idea is that we would take the recipient cells from a transplantation reaction, mycoplasmoicoides, and we will take those cells and produce 
a cell-free transcription translation mix, sort of like pure systems, what you do with E. coli. And we would drop into this a megaplasmid expressing proteins necessary for get that that would that would um, install in the membrane or install transporters in the membrane so that we can make vesicles containing this transcription translation mix that can exchange uh, metabolites between the extracellular space and the intracellular space. Uh, 10 years ago, Vincent Noirot, now at the University of Minnesota, showed that these, these vesicles containing TXTL systems would last um, many times longer than just simple TXTL systems. So we would have these uh, vesicles about the size of our, our cell uh, that would be able to exchange um, metabolites with the, between the intracellular and extracellular space. We wouldn't have a genome in this, just this plasmid, because big genomes are fragile. Now we have to work out a way to install a genome in these vesicles. And there's the transplantation approach. Kate, um, Kate thinks that we can also put these gene, the, the genomes in a vesicle and fuse the vesicle, or we even considered something called the cell squeeze to force the genome into vesicles. Um, and I had those things. Now, to our astonishment and great frustration, we wrote the proposal saying we'll make a TXTL system, but to our great, huge surprise and disappointment, for after more than a year of trying, we have been unable to make a transcription translation cell-free system from mycoplasma extracts. Uh, there's no one had ever, to our knowledge, even tried to do this. We thought it would be doable because it's doable in almost bacteria, but this is something that has stymied this project now. And we're trying to figure out ways around this. Uh, at this point, um, so that's at the point where we are with this project. We're always looking for great new ideas how we might solve this. Um, but to you know, close up, what I wanna do is summarize some of the findings that we have for this cell, because we think that this cell is fascinating and a great thing to work with. So um, the things we're trying to do now is this idea of building a living cell from non-living parts to figure out what all the genes do. Um, sorry, let me get my cursor up here. Um, to define a universal set of tasks for cells to do complete modeling of the cell, uh, high resolution imaging using cryotomography or expansion microscopy, um, get a better toolbox, mechanisms of genetic propagation, um, and a living platform to study really simplified cells or to build more complicated cells. Um, the work we think, we think GCJ, Syn3A will be a great tool and it is being used by a lot of groups. We let anybody who wants it have it. Uh, our vision is a cell where every gene is understood and every biological function is understood. Uh, and we're hoping to develop algorithms for genome redesign that will let us build more complicated organisms that would be able to devote maximal energy to their defined purpose. And we can redesign microbes for, to solve human problems. Um, to paraphrase the woman who was almost president, um, it takes a village to create a cell. And so there was a team of JCBI Dan Gibson did a staggering amount of work to develop the technology. Those of you who might have used Gibson Assembly appreciate his part in this effort. Um, Carol Lartigue, who is now uh, on faculty at the University of Bordeaux or ENRA in, in Bordeaux. Uh, Chuck Merriman has been really critical to design. Of course, Ham Smith, Clyde Hutchison, Craig. Kim Wise has been vital the last few years. Uh, the whole team was amazing. People at SGI were really valuable. I mentioned James Pelletier from the MIT Center for Bits and Atoms, Elizabeth, oops, Elizabeth Strachowski from NIST, uh, microscopist at UCSD, um, at the University of Illinois, Zan Luthi Shulton, 
leads a, an amazing team of computational biologists. And then University of Florida, Andrew Hansen and Valerie Creasy Lagarde have been helping us with some other things. The work is supported by uh, mostly synthetic genomics, but the more recent work by the National Science Foundation, the DARPA Biotechnologies Office, and JCBI. And with this, hopefully I've left some time for some questions. It's all yours. Thank you so much, John. Um, if anyone wants to ask questions, you have to unmute yourself. Um, and you can also ask questions on chat and we, John can look at that. Yeah, in Zoom, how do I find chat, Kate? Um, I will send a chat message to everyone so it you will see a blinking. Okay, got it. I see it. Uh, hi, John. This is Bogumil. Really nice. Bogumil, my really teammate. Nice. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really excellent. Great talk. I get so excited every time I hear this. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, I have one question as, you know, as you're progressing working on the cell and, and, and sharing with all the labs, is there any way to reclassify this, uh, this synthetic cell? So, you know, here in Canada, we will not be scared of it. Uh, it is very hard. I mean, it's almost impossible to uh, to try to because of all the regulations uh, with mycoplasma. So, is there any effort to reclassify the synthetic cells? We worked on this, and SGI worked on this, and it is so. This has only been done ever once during the Asilomar conference um, you know, three decades ago they by decree said that Haemophilus influenza, the organism that Hans, Tam Smith had used to develop restriction enzymes. This is the only time we've ever reduced the pathogen, the, an organism from BSL2 to BSL1. So Haemophilus influenza, a human pathogen, the RD strain was reclassified as a BSL-1 organism. And actually, since then, it is found to be involved in a new form of blindness that happens in Brazil, uh, the RD strain. But um, to get a bureaucrat for no, who has nothing to gain for this to go out and say that a BSL-2 organism is a BSL-1 organism, take that risk. What we have been repeatedly told is it's not going to happen. No one at NIH or no one at the USDA is willing to make that claim or, or, or change. We have found, though, that JCVI, the minimal cell, is so wimpy that it cannot even... So mycoplasma is the, the bane of, cell cult, of mammalian cell culture people. And um, they fear mycoplasma infection of their cultures. If you put SIN 1.0 or mycoplasma mycoides in a mammalian cell culture, it grows great. It lives off the cells. You know, it uses components in the media. You get a, 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 a nice bacterial culture in your, uh, with your mammalian cells. If you add SIN 3 or SIN 3A to mammalian cells, it dies. So I'm not afraid of the minimal cell, uh, and I can provide you know, information to anyone who wants it about that, but I, I don't know. We have tried hard to convince people to do a change in status, and I don't think it's ever going to happen. Okay, yeah. Yeah, it's so exciting, but here we, you know, in Canada, it's like three. So <laughs> I guess we have to fight the battle here. Thank you. Really great talk and really nice to hear from you. Thank you, Bogomil. Um, John, there are a couple of questions in chat. Oh, okay. Um, I'm looking, I'm looking. Uh, Hi, John. I actually asked one of the questions in chat there. Uh, well, I asked, me. what was the challenge with uh, TXTL of the minimal cell? Was it the purity function or... Where were the problems lying? We wish we knew. <laughs> we wish we knew. 
And it, it is worth noting though that compared to E. coli, so a bacillus, subtilis TXTL system is maybe 5% as efficient as coli. And, but, okay. you know, is messenger RNA being degraded? We're, we're going to figure this out or we're gonna find a workaround. Maybe we're gonna to have to use coli or, or, or find a way to use, let's say, use, use a, another organism's TXTL system and um, put some, some factors from mycoplasma mycoides in that might make us able to put a genome in, or we may just have to abandon the idea of, of using the, the a mycoplasma genome completely. Are, are you uh, but, concerned that any of the essential or non-essential genes with unknown function are kind of messing up the TXTL? Well, it could be a non-essential gene of unknown function. It could be a nuclease. It could be a, uh, we, we just don't know. It could be that, that there are components in, in a mycoplasma that are associated with the membrane we, we, we have tried everything we can think of and, you know, hopefully soon, maybe Kate or Wilhelm or a member of her team will give a, uh, one of these talks and we can either by then have figured out how to make this work or we can gain the wisdom, you know, ha have this crowdsourced and figure out how to do this. I wish I could answer that, Ryan. Looking forward to it. Thanks. Um, I'm still looking for chat. I know how to find it in, um, Kate, why don't you just read me the question? Oh, wait, there it is. No. You got it? No. Well, let's see. I don't, I think. Um, so, so the next, um, then the next question is, um, regarding TXTL by lysate, which one was more problematic transcription on translation? Did you analyze them separately too? Kate, you're better able to answer this than I am. Yeah, that's actually the work that um, we've been doing in my lab and that Wilhelm was doing in his lab. And yes, we analyze both transcription and translation. We are getting transcription. We are not getting translation. We're having issues with RNA stability, which we're figuring out. Um, we compared a lysate from a wild type mycoplasma, um, M. capricolum, and from John's uh, synthetic mycoplasma and we found that RNA stability increases a lot once you go to the minimal cell lysate, which makes sense because there are no nucleases. Um, and, but we are not seeing any translation. Uh, so current going theory is that the, there's something wrong with um, ribosomes. Uh, we also tried artificial transcription. We tried a T7 polymerase transcription. So we basically added an external T7 into our lysate and that produced the transcripts, but it did not translate. So that's where we are right now. And we're troubleshooting anyone who has any ideas of how to troubleshoot a weird TXTL system, please contact John and me and Wilhelm because we're kind of stuck at this point. Um, Dr. Armala, how did you, have you confirmed that there is no translation whatsoever? Um, yes, we used uh, several different reporter proteins. Um, in, we did it by fluorescence, we did it by Western blot. We have a reporter protein that's only uh, 14 amino acids long. Uh, it's a fluorescent uh, uh, peptide aptamer that uh, works really well in other TXCL systems. So. As far as we know, the mycoplasma, any mycoplasma extract is not capable of even making that, that uh, you know, a little over a dozen amino acids, a uh, tiny peptide. We don't know what's the problem. We don't know if it's translation initiation or elongation. We haven't figured that out. Um, I am tempted to do ribosomal profiling, uh, but it's such a pain in the lower back to do those experiments that um, we haven't yet. Is the RNA protected at all by chance? Like their um, uh, arm lengths at the ends to try and keep it from being degraded? Uh, no, it doesn't. Okay. That might be just a simple thing to test and try. I know Zach Sun's previous paper had a lot of information on how that might help uh, yeah. just in keeping the RNA active. Uh, that might be, the, that may be a little bit faster than 
uh, doing a whole ribosome profiling experiment. So we did time course of RNA stability using fluorescent RNA aptamers, and we did it using one type of aptamers, and Wilhelm's lab uh, did it using another type of aptamers. And so we have pretty good idea of RNA stability. Um, it just they weren't translated aptam; they were just uh, fluorescent RNA pieces of fluorescent RNA that um, were not uh, ORF sequences. And we have a reporter proteins that John gave us that supposed to be really good mycoplasma reporters. There. Yeah. Seem to so be. it is. This this is. You know, you 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 look for interesting problems, but this is this is a step that we thought would be trivial. Who knew? Yeah, the famous last words. Mm -hmm. One last thing, and I'm happy to take more questions, but I, I, I failed to mention that, that Dr. Li Ji Sun, who's a postdoc in our group, has been, I think, the, the dominant worker of our last few years to um, produce the molecules, the organisms that we've used to analyze a lot about the minimal cell. Uh, these are the folks who were more critical, Dan, Carol, et cetera, with, with the development of the cell but really with the analysis, Liji has become a master at manipulating the organism and, um, and, and producing things that other groups have been using to, to analyze. One of the things, building these cells, while it is basic molecular biology tools that we've developed, we have found it very effective or more effective for our team to build cells and share mutants uh, that are requested or designed by collaborators than it is for them to try to, to develop these techniques. Genome transplantation, while it has been done by other labs than ours, is a very touchy technique. Uh, and so we really try to do everything we can to have our team help our collaborators be as productive you know, collectively as productive as possible. Come on, you guys, th this, this is a substandard set of questions you've come up with while they are good questions. Uh, I, I expected more from the build a cell group. Uh, so what is, um, actually this might be a bit of a touchy question. What exactly is the uh, proprietary rights in terms of sharing your strains? I know there've been some questions previously where for people that work with VNAT, for instance, um, where they try to shy away from the uh, Craig Bentz, uh, from the from the ones that we got from uh, the institute, just because uh, sometimes it's not uh, the easiest to work with in terms of uh, what's the uh, what, what what would be the term uh, what is uh, readily available to everybody or uh, okay. without license agreements. Well, so you have to have material transfer agreement. You have to have a biosafety level two lab, um, and you you can't sell it. So you know, if, if, if you plan to make money off it, you have to get some special deal from synthetic, from, from SGI DNA, now known as Codex. But we're willing to give it to anybody. Uh, we ask that, we don't demand, we ask that if you discover something amazing and plan to publish, you let us know in advance. Um, but most mostly it is that you are um, you know you have BSL2 conditions and you don't plan to sell it and uh, if you hurt yourself with it it's your own fault you know like if you have a large vat of it and you pour it on yourself or uh, drown in a giant container of it or something in terms of sharing stuff that people make themselves is that also Supposed yeah, to we, we, we just, we, Craig is afraid that people are going to, that, that this thing will, will get out and that uh, I, I, what I want to do is to make it free to everybody. And I'm trying to work out a thing with the ATCC to let them, them do it. And you can, then you can do whatever you want with the derivatives. Um, this is an organism that at least in the U.S., there is significant regulation. So you have to get a USDA permit to do interstate transport 
or you go straight to Guantanamo. Um, but no one has found the material transfer agreement that we have to be problematic. Sure, I understand. Basically, it says you can publish, you, you know, and and I let people share it with each other. So I have collaborators in Japan, and it's just easier for them to share it with each other than it is for me to to um, mail things. I, I pretty much let you do it in anything you want with it. Um, but, you know, I would be, I, I think SGI will, will be upset if you try to sell it, which that seems reasonable, don't you think? Yeah, I agree. It, um, no, this is, uh, the VNet stuff really came out of some people that were more interested in uh, industrial applications of the organism. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, that's kind of outside the realm of this group, I think, to a certain extent. Remember that this, the media for this organism is really expensive. Mm -hmm. Although several industrial organizations have purchased the cell, we've, you know, SDI, they, they own the cell, but they don't even have any of them. We, we dispense them to everybody right now. And um, they are trying to use these to model some of their industrial biotechnology processes. You know, if you drop a new pathway into the minimal cell, you might be able to better understand how the pathway may affect existing, e existing cellular machinery. Uh, one, of the, one of the projects I have with Tobias Erb from, um, and Roland Leal from Marburg and uh, from University of Marburg and Max Planck Marburg is to drop uh, Toby's uh, catch carbon fixation system into the minimal cell. Uh, so previously it's only been, been used in a cell-free system, but we're trying to put it into the minimal cell and that'll be adding about 23 genes. So Lee G, for instance, is doing most of, most of that work in our shop. But there are other things that could be added. We're going to make the thing into a, uh, for this catch system process, we'll make the organism a glycine oxytroph, for instance. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. and, and I share any of the mutants we have made with other people as well. Um, John, there are a couple more um, chat questions. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to say to everyone who loves this seminar as I did, it's an awesome system to work with. But when you first start growing the cells that John will send you and you are setting up your BSL2 protocol, I got an email from my biosafety people saying, you want to do what? Grow a mycoplasma like on purpose? Because obviously everyone's used, used to trying to eradicate mycoplasma from tissue culture rooms. So if you're trying to add mycoplasma to your BSL2 protocol, um, they're looking at you like you grew a third leg because this is not something usually done. And, and it, it, I, I, you know, I also provide people with a list of facts. So, we grow mammalian cells in the same incubators that we grow the mycoplasmas. And all, essentially all mycoplasma contamination of mammalian cells is from one of six organisms that humans carry. And so if your cells are contaminated with mycoplasma, it's not gonna be our cells. It's, it's going to be um, the something that, that you know, the humans in the lab gave their own mammalian cells. And as I said, the minimal cell will not contaminate anything. Uh, the minimal cell, we have never tested it in goats, but if it won't grow in a HeLa cell culture, it's probably not going to grow in a goat. Um, but I, I don't have the half a million dollars it would take to do a, a, a goat experiment. Um, we also, Drew Indy's team at Stanford has through, um, through the Biobricks Foundation and TWIST has synthesized a standard genetic code set of minimal cell genes. We don't have all the genes, but we have like 95% of the proteins. And so we're, you know, they are happy to give those, that gene set to anyone as well. So that you could express, if you wanted to study an individual protein, you could express it in coli and make boatloads boat of it to do biochemistry or whatever. Okay, I'm still, so if you can read me questions since I um, seem to, I seem yep. to be a Luddite here. So, um, okay, 
one uh, fascinating talk. I'm wondering how much you think a minimal mycoplasma cell would differ from a minimal cell of another species or phylum. How universal do you think the conclusions we can draw from these cells are? And are there other cells you think would be especially interesting to look at next? Well, I, you know, I would be, I would really be interested in, um, and, and there are efforts to make a minimal coli, but I mean, I'm trying to, um, but I, I think there are a great number of, of cells. So can you guys see this one? We think any minimal cell that you make has to be able to do all of these things. It has to make these chemicals. It has to use these elements. It has to do all of these processes. As I said, you know, you can have a cell that imports lysine or you can have a cell that synthesizes lysine. If you took a prochlorococcus, you know, the small cells that, that make everything, they make their amino acids, their nucleic acids, they, they do photosynthesis, you know, if you minimize that cell, probably there's not a whole lot that you can take out of it. Um, but every organism, even, even this organism, if we had made different choices with synthetic lethal pairs, we would have a slightly different cell. Even now, I think there are probably another maybe 10 more genes that we could take out of this cell and still have it grow at, um, at, at, at two hours with a doubling time of two hours or less. But I don't think we're ever gonna get around to that because figuring out how the cell works is much more important than understanding, than, than, than you know, achieving a record of the, 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 the world's first true minimal cell. As I said, we are working with Syn3A, which uh, we, we may make a version of Syn3.0 that has just the additional seven genes necessary for the normal phenotype, but working with a cell that is more reliable and, and tractable it's, it's, it's another version of a minimal cell. So the smallest cell that we know of that, is, that can be pipetted easily is not SYN 3.0, it's SYN 3A. I, I think there's an infinite number of minimal cells that could be made. You know, in theory, you know, we could make a minimal human. There's probably gotta be a lot of genes that we don't need. Uh, I, I, not, not that I'm urging anyone to do that, I will get mail and maybe protesters outside that I don't need. So. Okay, one more question from chat, and I think we should start wrapping up because I know people are there, I'll have other things on their schedule. So the question is, Ariel, you, you mentioned a complete heterotroph cell. Arguably, it is not alive if it cannot produce and maintain its own structures and components, like a virus. An example, no apopoiesis. Well, uh, boy, that's, that, that's, that's a semantic question. So, um, and is E. coli and M9 media, which is just salts. So, you know, it can't survive if you don't give it glucose and salts. Uh, our cell has to make all of its, um, I, 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 am I talking, I, I think I'm talking about, we're talking about the same things. The idea that the mycoplasma is, it, it can grow in culture if you provide it fatty acids, nucleic acids, uh, you know, metabolites, some of them complicated, uh, but it, it still grows in the absence of any other life form. A virus has to have a living cell uh, or a phage has to have a living cell to be produced. A, 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 a living cell is something that can replicate itself in the absence of any other living system. I hope that answers the question. Um, if not, we'll chat offline. Can I ask one quick question? Just before sure. we uh, finish. Sorry, I know it's running over time. Um, I, uh, James Henley from Imperial College. Um, it was a great talk. I just wanted, could you comment on the, um, the, the lipid side of these minimal, minimal cells and the sort of uh, how complex the, the membrane structures might be compared to the wild type? Um, I'm just really curious about that. So, this is something that we are working on. 
uh, a, 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 among the collaborations, our 37 collaborations, we're working with James Science from um, Technical University of Dresden, who is really focusing on the lipid composition. And so um, we know that the membrane contains about 35% cholesterol by weight. And the cell can be grown maybe in the absence of cholesterol, but it's a really, really wimpy cell. So the cholesterol contributes to membrane fluidity. There's phosphatidylglycerol. We maybe need some sphingolipids. This is getting better understood and we're almost to the point, well, we are just now to the point that we can grow the wild type organism in a fully defined, uh, in a fully defined media that contains specific lipids, but we can't grow the minimal cell in a defined media. But we will have a paper, or James and us will have a paper out soon that really carefully defines the lipids. I don't, I don't want to steal his thunder by talking about it more than I have. The group in Barcelona working with Mycoplasma pneumoniae, a, a human pathogen, uh, that they're using as sort of a minimal cell platform has defined has a defined media for their cell, but their their in view their view of that it's is it's proprietary now, and they're not they say they have it, but they're not telling you what it is. Um, sorry, I can't be more specific than that right now, but soon you'll find out. No, that's great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for listening. Um, you know, go build a cell. Um, and I look forward to seeing more of you talk soon. If any of you have questions or you want to sell, you know, jglass, jcvi.org, write me and we'll make it happen. If, so long as you promise not to use the cell for nefarious purposes, of course. Uh, I didn't mention that, but that's sort of understood. Thank you so much, John. That was awesome. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye.